So I just finished doing 19.3. It's a lot of handstand push-ups, or maybe not a lot of handstand push-ups. I got to watch Travis Mayer do the workout twice in one day, got to watch Noah do the workout, got to watch our whole on-site group go. And the major theme I had this week is I don't really think in this type of a format of a workout that people are going to be able to make dramatic increases in their overall score because handstand push-ups are such a bottleneck for most people. Now, there are gonna be exceptions to that, and I didn't wanna say, okay, well, I can't help you get better. So what I am gonna do from a short-term performance perspective is analyze how you would get better at each one of the movements in the four for this workout. So I'll break it down if you got held up in the lunges, the step-ups, in the handstand push-ups, and handstand walk. And because I felt I couldn't really add that much value to your overall redo. What I thought would be cool to do this week is cover if you did get exposed in one of the movements of this workout, how would you construct a training program that's more focused on long-term athletic development than just getting better in a redo on a singular workout? So let's jump into that. Whether you wanna shave seconds off your time, improve your second attempt, or if you're just having second thoughts about doing the open, we got you covered with our second thoughts. So I'm gonna start with short-term performance first. 19.3, you wanna get better at it and you redo either tomorrow or on Monday. If you're losing time on lunges, I think there are pretty much three major reasons why people are gonna lose time in lunges relative to an elite performer. The first is just general fitness. And if your general fitness is something that's a limitation, that means like by the time you finished going down and back the 25 foot segments eight times, your heart rate, your respiration, your panic level, all of that stuff was out of control and you didn't feel like you had the ability to continue to push throughout the workout. So let's just call that like a global limitation or just general fitness. The other is mobility limitations. So a lot of people that are training for CrossFit, they don't do a lot of varied patterns. They don't do single arm overhead. They don't do hip dissociation work where you're training in a regular basis is going into hip flexion when you're squatting and going into knee flexion, but you don't do that much lunging with a vertical torso where you get comfortable basically putting all of your weight forward onto one leg where the back leg gets stretched out. And so there could be some overhead mobility issues or hip-based issues for people with regards to lunges. And then the last would just be general weakness. So maybe it's general weakness holding it overhead. Maybe it's general weakness unilaterally getting out of the lunge position. Maybe it's just general rigidity and core stiffness weakness. I think those three issues would encompass why you would potentially lose time in lunges. Now, you're not gonna get overall that much more fit. You're not gonna get overall that much more overhead mobility or improve your hip mobility in two days. And you're not gonna get that much stronger in a pattern of motion in two days. But what you can do is change your psychology with regards to how you're gonna approach it, and you can warm your body up a little bit more um, intensely to make sure that you're ready to get through this portion without giving away too much of your energy to move into the next portion of the workout. So all of that comes to an appropriate warm up from my perspective. So one, making sure your heart rate, your respiration rate, and all of that stuff is really ramped up. Having some sort of a plan in place where you know, okay, I'm gonna do 25 feet, switch my arm, another 25 feet, and go through the same video review process we talked about in the first two First Thoughts videos for 19.1 and 19.2, but figure out if it took you three minutes, how can you make this two and a half minutes? Where can you take your breaks? Where did your heart rate escalate? Where did you start to feel out of control? And figure out a way when you approach it next time that you believe that the exposure the first time was enough that you've adapted and feel stronger and more capable to tackle it the second time. Now, there are a lot of things that happen when you do an uncertain workout like this that maybe didn't happen in 19.2, because 19.2, you knew the workout. 19.1, was a little bit more simple and things we're more familiar with. So when something novel comes out like this, people get anxious, they might be scared about the handstand push-up and put too much of their warm-up time into the handstand push-ups because they think that's where their bottleneck is and they don't do all of the stuff that's necessary to put them in the appropriate mind state to tackle the workout. So one of the things that you can do is make sure that you do an extensive warm-up on whatever your limitation was in these three things. So if it's general weakness, one thing I'd tell people is 
warm up your overhead lunge to something heavier than the load that's going to be used in the actual workout. This just will give you a little psychological relief when you pick the dumbbell up and let's say you're male and you're using the 50, if you warm up with a 60 or you warm up with a 70 and you just get that pattern rigid and tight and feeling strong, then when you get to start the workout, there's kind of a little psychological boost when you pick it up and you're like, oh, this feels light versus you pick it up and it feels like it's moving all over the place. You don't feel rigid. You don't feel like you have stability. So picking a warm up with, from a general weakness perspective where you go a little bit heavier. Overhead mobility and hips, any sort of mobility strategies would be good there. We'll link in the description some of the loaded stretching, end range liftoffs, locomotion style movement training from our movement archive, which you can do here to make sure that those patterns of motion are at ranges where you feel like you're comfortable, able to breathe, able to be able to do the movement without feeling like things are being overstretched or like you can't breathe in the position. The last thing you wanna do is put the dumbbell overhead, go to take a lunge, and then every lunge step you take, you have to go like that and brace and not be able to actually have a comfortable and smooth breath. And then general fitness is just, get your heart rate, respiration up, and have a pacing plan to make sure that you can cut a little bit of time off of your lunges. So that's if you lost time on the lunge steps. As you move on, obviously now we're getting more fatigued, and as you get deeper into the workout, you're becoming a higher score profile in this specific workout. So for step ups, what I've seen with most people is that there's too much thinking with regards to the coordination. So the first thing that you can do is do a ton of work either on Sunday or tonight and do unloaded step up practice to find a rhythm. You don't wanna get into the workout and have to be thinking, okay, left foot's up, and now on my next step, which foot's coming up? Okay, right, okay, now left. Oh, I did left by accident, damn it, I messed up. You don't want that type of stuff going through your mind. So you need to have some sort of a cadence on your ri or a rhythm for you so that when you get to the step ups, you can just continue to work. So I kept thinking right up, right down, left up, left down, and when my left foot was going up, my right foot came up, and then my left foot would be the first one to come down, and then my right foot would come down, just touch the ground and come back up. So then I would go right back to the opposite cadence, right up, right down. And then I would only focus on one leg at a time. So that leg is basically going up and down, and the other one is just going down to the ground, kissing the ground and coming back up. Now, that rhythm worked for me, it's something that I practiced the night before, the day before, to make sure that I like didn't get into the workout and think, what the hell leg do I have to use? But whatever rhythm you have to use to make sure that you can just get through those continuously would make sense. I'd also practice some sort of hip dissociation warm up. So maybe starting on a low box and then slowly lowering yourself to step down and doing that on both sides and just getting really comfortable making sure that your hips are really opened and ready to segment against one another because both of these first two movements challenge that. I've seen a lot of people in the CrossFit space and the competitive space that are really good at bilateral hinging, bilateral jumping, bilateral squatting, but when it comes to unilateral stuff, their balance and overall coordination isn't good. So make sure you are warming up hip dissociation, which I think ties into the lunges because it's basically a very similar unilateral pattern. From this perspective, I haven't seen that people are able to gain a ton of time even at the elite level on the step up portion of the workout because the movement in and of itself is kind of slow. Now, if you have long legs and this is a really comfortable movement for you, you might be able to make up a little bit of time, but if you can just get into this and have a good rhythm and just grind through all 50 reps with very brief breaks either on the top of the box or when you switch the dumbbell, this should be a portion of the workout that is just general work capacity. The legs are kind of burning here. You get into the step ups, the first couple suck, and then you kind of get into a rhythm and a routine where it's l slow enough that your heart rate's kind of able to come back down to a more manageable level, and then it's just kind of grunt work. So from a, from a strategy perspective, I don't know if there's gonna be that much video review stuff that would be helpful here, unless you really broke down in the step ups. So that's something that you're just gonna have to play with on an individual basis. Moving into the handstand pushups, this is where video review is gonna be the most important part. There's not really that much I can tell people to improve when there's a strict strength-based 
body weight movement that's the primary limitation in the workout. If you're not good at strict handstand push-ups, you will not finish well in this workout. There's no other major separator that is going to take up as much time as the handstand push-ups here. And if you don't know your handstand push-up capacity, so for me, I started training strict handstand push-ups just to prepare for the open like six to eight weeks ago, and I don't have my own data on where's my 100 for time right now, where's my 50 for time right now, how many can I do unbroken? So I had to kind of go into this workout blind and say, all right, my goal is just not to blow up, do small sets and get into a rhythm. Now, if I was gonna redo it, the most important part of the workout for me would be to analyze this and see how many did I do per minute? So I got there at 440, I had five minutes and 20 seconds to do handstand push-ups. I think I rested for like 30 seconds before doing my first set of four. And then I'd have to go through and say, okay, how many did I do in the first minute versus my last minute? When did they get to failure? Could I maybe have done doubles? Do I do doubles on a 10 second clock? Have some sort of a plan for your handstand push-ups. And also know that your ability to make dramatic gains in a strict handstand push-up from a short-term perspective are not gonna be great. It's not gonna be something that you can just automatically do better at like a light thruster or a light wall ball because the strength requirements are so high. The other, I guess, just tips aside from video review is stay away from the failure zone you felt in the last, last attempt. So you should be able to feel yourself getting kind of close to failure as you're doing handstand push-ups. And the sensation that you felt in one is something that you should remember so that when you go into two, if you start to get close to that threshold and you're two minutes away from the end of the workout, you need to back off a little bit and add an extra break. I made a mistake in the workout right in the end I was trying to catch Brandy's score and I was trying to like have a final kick on the handstand push-up so I took a short break and then that was the first rep that I actually failed and I only got one handstand push-up in my last 30 seconds of the workout. So if I were to redo it, I'd obviously try to stay away from that failure point and maybe I could have gotten two or three in that last 30 seconds had I waited. So there's definitely something that you can learn just from the experiential feeling you got from the first attempt more evenly spaced out work. So that's obviously something you get from video review. And then when you're doing video review with something that's so strength-based, something that I always tell people is expect that there's gonna be some sort of a drop off in power. So in a workout that's like a one mile run for time, you're probably gonna have pretty linear splits in a high level athlete of their first 400, their second 400, their third 400, and then maybe a little bit faster with a final kick to end. But the splits will be pretty close to evenly spaced out or maybe even negative splits for people. With a strength movement, like a strict handstand pushups, generally your nervous system is gonna be better in the beginning and there's going to be some taper and fall off as you go. So trying to create a linear pace model I feel like is not the best strategy. So maybe add a little bit less rest time in the beginning to your plan and then as you get closer to the end, if you're saying, okay, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do two reps on the 10 seconds until I get to 10 reps. Then I'm gonna do two reps on the 12 seconds until I get to 20. Then two reps on the 15 seconds until I get to 30. And have a plan that's set up that way where you're actually building in a little bit more rest as your nervous system with this pattern is starting to break down. So the only way to come up with that is that's a video review process and it's very individual based on where your handstand push-up level is. There's obviously a ton of variance in this if you can do you know, 40 unbroken strict handstand push-ups, then the way that you're approaching this is gonna be way different than if you're gonna do five. Also take into consideration, so singles is a very, very effective strategy for some people in this workout. However, it's something you gotta think about that constantly coming up and then kicking back down and just constantly going into that inversion pattern and catching yourself on your hands is a little bit more work than doing singles on something like toes to bar where you're just kinda jumping up six inches and grabbing onto the bar. So take into consideration that you're pressing muscles are being used to catch yourself and then stabilize yourself on the wall when you're doing singles. But we have had a lot of people on site that put up really good scores utilizing singles when they got to failure. And I had to go to singles at the end because I just didn't have any pressing left in me. So it's something that you're probably gonna have to do if your handstand push-up capacity isn't good enough to get through those 50 with bigger sets. The handstand walk, if you're getting to this portion, you're obviously, 
you're pretty good at just general CrossFit because there is a good amount of work here. The handstand push-ups is a movement that is gonna be bottlenecked by strength, so you get through all 50 and then you get to the handstand walk. So if you are, you probably know what you need to do from this, like in this movement, in this format. However, the things that I've seen that could potentially be an issue is that people are not ready to be warmed up to move fast when they're doing handstand walks. So I saw a lot of people were basically doing their warmups as if this was going to fail and be the major limitation. So they didn't really do a lot of body line and positional work for handstand walks where you gotta get used to being leaned forward farther than where the wall is and where the wall's stopping you when you're doing strict handstand push-ups. So there is a spinal and core component to warming up your handstand, uh, handstand walks, a core component to the handstand walks, and getting used to the fact that most people, if they're getting to the handstand walks, by the time they're getting there are a little bit frantic. You're frustrated because this is just a bottleneck that's slowing you down, and then you wanna actually do your handstand walks, and you know that the time is ticking away, and you can see, you know, I only have a minute left, I need to get as much handstands as possible. So people are kind of frantic, their respiration's out of control, so I think one thing that you can do is warm it up well if you know that you're gonna get there, and the second thing is make sure you give yourself a cue right before to stay tight through the core. I've watched the people that I've watched that got to the handstand walks in person, you can visibly see just a ton of core movement. They're breathing. There's like a break in the lower back. People's lower backs actually got really sore from this workout from doing the handstand walks when they got that deep into the workout. So make sure that you have a cue to yourself to stay tight and try to keep the movement as smooth and fluid as possible because your stabilization muscles in your triceps and shoulders are burnt out from doing handstand push-ups. So I think the handstand walk thing, you kind of have to wrap yourself back up into the belief concept that, all right, now you know what to expect. You know what you need to do from a psychological perspective to be prepared for it, warm up appropriately. And if you get through all of that from a handstand walk perspective, you should be able to do a little bit better when you get there, knowing what it's gonna feel like the second time. So in the last first thought, Thoughts video or the first two first thoughts videos, I just talked about short term performance that I just covered. But what I wanted to do was talk about how do you get better outside of a redo? So you want to get better for the October open or you want to compete at a sanctional event or you want to go to a licensed competition, then going through a video analysis to get better at one workout three days later is not going to really do anything for you for the long term. So I wanted to kind of talk about how I think about development of athletes or training programs to get people better in a way that no matter what comes out in a specific subset of tests, you're more prepared than you would have been in the past. And the first thing I wanna talk about from that perspective is that I have a philosophy as a coach that you can train for sports performance and health at the same time. I've had some mentors and coaches in the past that say good performance starts where good health ends. I haven't found that that is an accurate reflection of reality. I haven't found that you automatically have to deteriorate your health to make yourself more fit or more capable to compete. And I've actually found that a lot of people, even from a blood chemistry perspective, a psychological perspective, a lot of people that are competitive, engaged in the competition, enjoying the competitive experience, are quite healthy as people. So I think that you can integrate a training program for somebody that just generally wants to be the best version of themselves and wants to be competitive, either at just a low level, like in your gym or at a qualifier or something like that, or at a professional level. And then it's just a matter of how much volume of you are you doing, how intense are you being, how many competitions are you gonna go to. But I do think that it's possible and I'm gonna try to illustrate that through how I construct training programs. So this training program, just for simplicity's sake, is designed around the lunges limitation of the short-term performance model. So let's say I had some arbitrary athlete or somebody that is watching this video was like, man, those overhead lunges just crushed me. I wasn't good at them. It made me feel really out of shape. I lost two minutes to my friend on that portion of the workout. I didn't really get to the handstand push-ups until eight minutes. And if I could have been more fit on that 200 feet of lunges, then I would have felt more comfortable to be able to expose my 
absolute capacity. So something comes out, you identify a weakness. We're identifying that the weakness is lunges. I took this program and I said, all right, well, for most people that are training, you just want some sort of general physical capacity. You wanna be stronger, you wanna be more mobile, you wanna have better overall conditioning, and you want that to be able to transfer into you doing something competitive like CrossFit Open that you enjoy and that's fun and that helps engage you in the community, but you also want your body to be healthy and resilient long-term to be able to do other types of things. Now, if that's the assumption that I'm making with an athlete, then I'm gonna say, okay, well, if people are training one time a day, I need to integrate some sort of strength energy system movement into most training days. If I'm just buying it, biasing it that three days a week are strength, one day a week is energy system, and one day a week is movement, then I'm not gonna really have that general level of physical preparedness because I'm obviously biasing the limited amount of physical work I do to one type of physical stressor. So the body will start to self-organize to that one thing, and you won't get as many adaptations in the other aspects of training. So. First thing, very simple, barbell walking lunges, 25 foot segments times six, resting two minutes between. So a lot of people don't think of the fact that you could actually do barbell lunges or lunges in a strength-based format. They see it in a workout like 19.3, and a lot of people will do like lunge everyday programs where they're doing 400 meters of walking lunges, or they'll do lunges in workouts, or lunges in metcons, or lunges in high-intensity interval formats, but they don't really ever think about the fact that if you need your hips to be strong and segment then you need to be able to load that comfortably and figure out how to create force in there. And there are little things that a lot of people don't think about, like the strength of your big toe to get into extension on the back foot, the length of the hip flexor on the back leg, and being able to get really elongated and also be able to load it. So very basic initial strength portion, just to make sure that if general weakness is a limitation, it's something we're targeting. I thought the best way to illustrate this was this training program for the day is targeting whether or not this person is a general fitness limitation, overhead mobility and hip limitation, or general weakness. I just felt like it makes sense to put training for any of those limitations into one program. Then the structure is bike one minute and 90% effort, then 100 feet walking lunges. Rest one to one, meaning if this takes you three minutes, your rest break is three minutes. Then the same thing, you're gonna bike one minute, then 200 feet of walking lunges, rest one to one, bike one minute at 90% effort, then 300 feet of walking lunges. The reason I structured it like this is when you get into a competitive setting with something like lunges, in this workout specifically, it started with lunges, so you're fresh when you get into it, but we don't wanna train just for 19.3. So if something came up like 16.1, where there's overhead walking lunges and it's multiple rounds, and you might have to do 50 feet times eight rounds or something like that, then you have to have the volume tolerance and comfort to do 400 feet of potential walking lunges in a 20 minute window, then you need to to have volume and conditioning built in, and you also need to have it built in under fatigue. So to create that fatigue, I could make this 200 feet, 400 feet, 600 feet, but from a training perspective, the more volume you're doing of a singular pattern, the more likely you are to get pattern overload issues and start to break your body down. So it's better to create limitations in, or increases in fatigue, like maybe your heart rate's gonna be more increased, your legs are gonna be burning more on a cyclical machine that's low tension, and then when you're accumulating your work of the walking lunges, which is your major priority of this training session, you're a little bit more fatigued. So now you're getting practice under fatigue of the movement. Now for this energy system portion of the workout, I basically just left three specific options. So that way you can look at the workout and know like, all right, this workout, it's made up for an arbitrary person that I didn't run an assessment on and I don't really know exactly what I'm training. I just know that I want to get them better at lunges because that's gonna help me illustrate the point. So you have three options that I would lay out here. So if somebody was a general weakness and they needed to get stronger, then I'd have a loading focus with this workout. Meaning in my first set, the H is gonna designate that my 100 walk feet of walking lunges is gonna be heavy. And that heavy is relative to that athlete. How heavy can you take it? Well, you take it as heavy as they could do 100 feet 
unbroken or in just four 25 foot segments without having to take a break. Then if I'm on that loading focus, when I go to 200 feet, I'm gonna lower the load to keep the same intensity, have them accumulate the 200 feet at a lighter load and then 300 feet at a light load. So it might look like, you know, a 135 pound barbell, 250, 250 pound dumbbells in a front rack, and then a weighted vest for this one. So that would be if a loading was the primary limitation for this athlete. If this is pacing focus, so let's say you watch somebody do this lunges, and this athlete on a regular basis, one of the major reasons why they're failing in workouts is because they don't know how to appropriately pace their energy. So they're going out way too fast, or they're going out way too slow and, and having so much energy at the end that you're like, you definitely could have went harder. So you can do this same type of format where the load in every one of these is exactly the same, but you have forced breaks. So unbroken in my first set, two planned breaks in the second and tell them, hey, I want you to be within 20 seconds of this pace multiplied by two. So if this took me, say, a minute to do, then I want you to be able to do this in 220, and you get two breaks within there. You can use them whenever you want, just make sure that your speed of movement is good enough to be able to match what your 100 feet time was with those two extra rest breaks. Then in the 300, five rest breaks. And these are just arbitrary numbers to explain that you can teach people as they're getting more fatigued, how to maintain and their speed and preserve what they need to be able to do quickly under fatigue. Then a movement complexity focus. So if somebody did have an overhead mobility and hips issue, then I might do two arm overhead walking lunges in my first set when I have only 100 feet, which is definitely a major overextension fault pattern that a lot of people will fall into. So it's maybe not a pattern of motion I'd wanna spend a lot of time conditioning, but it can allow them to get challenged enough that they'll start to open up their patterns of motion and start to get a little bit more uh, mobility and comfort with their positions overhead. Then for my 200 feet, I'll do one arm overhead. And then for my last one, I'll do front rack. So you can see that the level of complexity of the movement and the end ranges of motion that are required are decreasing as I go from set to set. So this would be my conditioning portion of the workout, all focused on lunges being a primary place that people lost time. And then after that, I'd have 30 minutes of movement work on the lunge pattern specifically. So this could be laying hip dissociation drills to get people comfortable separating, segmenting their hips. But when you're laying down on the ground, you don't need to worry about stabilizing your spine, stabilizing your midline. So after all of this challenge, most people are asymmetrical, either you know, they do things on one side more frequently or they played a sport that was rotating to one side. So most of us aren't perfectly symmetrical. And when we do a bunch of work like this, we're kind of re-ingraining the asymmetries into our body. So if we can lay down and do some hip dissociation drills afterwards, we can kind of undo some of the potential damage we did from an asymmetry perspective. Then you could do some lunge matrices. So this is, would be lunging in different directions. So in our movement archive, we also have a lunge matrix with which I'll put in the description so you can take a look at it. But basically, lunging and doing a curtsy lunge, crossing your midline, lunging forward, lunging out to the side, lunging all the way out to the side, lunging diagonal backwards, lunging backwards, then crossing over behind you and lunging, or lunging and actually doing walking lunges going backwards, doing walking lunges where you're taking wide steps, doing inline walking lunges where you're actually trying to lunge on a specific line. When you get this level of movement complexity and you feel comfortable doing all of those different patterns, then something like this pops up and you're like, oh, I just gotta lunge in a straight line with my arm overhead. That feels like a much lower complexity movement to you because you have all of these options to be able to balance yourself with your feet separated. So I'm a big advocate of doing that. In my advanced athletes training program in the off season, we'll do a ton of that type of stuff to basically make sure that when they're done competing, they can still run, move, grapple, and do all sorts of different types of movement things without feeling like they only have this kind of rigid pattern of motion or couple patterns of motion that they've just done hundreds and thousands of times trying to get better at competitive CrossFit. Then single leg balance drills, 
and any sort of individualized loaded stretching. So this would be, all right, if I know that this athlete, as an example, has very tight hip flexors, then I might create some couch stretch, couch stretch loaded stretching with their arms overhead and give them specific amount of time to stay in it and then isometrics in both positions. So this would be one training program for one of the limitations that were exposed in this workout. Now, in a real world scenario, I'm probably not just gonna take an entire training session on one limitation unless it's an athlete that has really, really good broad fitness, but one major, major weakness that I need to basically target one or two days a week and just focus on that. Most people have you know, a couple of weaknesses, but they really need everything to get better to achieve their goals, so you create a more balanced training program. So this would just be an example of how I would train somebody from a long-term performance perspective. I shared this basically to get some feedback on whether or not this is helpful to start thinking about how to train long-term versus short-term for athletes. And then also in our mentorship program, as our one of our first pieces of content that we're gonna launch, I'm gonna jump into all of the different movements. So I'll do a step up variation of this, a handstand push up variation of this, also broken down by different levels. So if you got less than 10, 10 to 30, 30 to 50, and how you would train handstand push ups in this type of a format, then handstand walks. And then because those are kind of unrealistic formats, unless those are just major weaknesses for you, the handstand push ups might be a major weakness for people, but those are unrealistic. I'm also going to do a general competition preparedness. So basically, how would I create a training program one day and then progress over four weeks to be able to get better at anything that could potentially come up single leg with pressing or inverted gymnastics? So instead of thinking I just want to get better at 19.3, I say, okay, well, after I analyze the open, my athlete is, you know, a thousandth place on the leaderboard on this one test and 300 average on the other four tests. So getting better at this style of workout is super important, but I don't wanna just train them for that. So I'll create a general competition preparation to make sure that they're better at what's themed in this workout. Then I'll also create a specific competition prep. So basically, if you're gonna repeat this test, so somebody got really exposed on this and they say, hey, I wanna redo 19.3 in six weeks and I wanna get better. I think it's an important thing as a coach to know if somebody has an identifiable test that they wanna get better at, how do you create a training program that gives them the confidence and belief that they can go in and they can improve that? Now, most sports outside of CrossFit, you know the tests, like weightlifting, you know it's gonna be three snatches and three clean and jerks. Powerlifting, you know you're gonna have your deadlift, your, your back squat and your bench press. Most preparation for strength and conditioning coaches you know, but in a sport like this that's chaotic, you don't. However, I think it's important to know how to get people better at tests like this because I think it's important from a confidence perspective to say, okay, I had a weakness, I went through a training cycle, I got better at that weakness, I climbed the leaderboard, now I have more confidence going into the next open that I'm more fit and I'm more able to get closer to my training goals. So. Those will be the training programs that will be in the mentorship program related to this content piece and just a new, more interactive model with our new courses that are coming out that are basically released as we're creating it so we can get more interaction and use the interaction to be able to create and stimulate dialogue moving forward. So we're pretty excited about that. If you like this content, more of it will be in the mentorship program. And then obviously for our online training program, people that are already in our competitor program know this is kind of the format of how I create my training programs to be able to make people get better and then create some education for an athlete so you know what the intention of the training session is and what we're trying to get better at. In the new format of that, because we launched just 16 weeks, we're gonna launch where we basically have five specific paths that people can follow. So people that are sanctional level competitors, people that are open or local competitors, people that just want varied, broad fitness. So they wanna be able to get fit, do the open, but that might not be a primary goal. So that might be somebody who thinks like, I just wanna be healthy and do the open for fun. Then a strength focus and an energy system focus. So 
Hopefully this kind of gives you a perspective of what we're trying to cover with second thoughts to get you better in your next attempt of 19.3. And then in the future, or if you're watching this video after the open and you just, you know, interested in getting better at 19.3 and you happen to find this, this is how you can kind of construct training programs over a longer term period to set you up better to be a better CrossFit athlete and also just have better general physical training capabilities. All right, so those are our second thoughts for 19.3. If you're interested in that mentorship program or online program that I mentioned, head over to trainingthinktank.com slash 19.3. Point is spelled out as a word, so 19.3. We'll be back on Monday with Travis versus Trevor. This will be an interesting week because he's already done the workout twice in one day. He's gonna do it again on Monday, so we're gonna have Travis versus Trevor versus Timmy the Toolman. Then we'll be back on Thursday or Friday with 19.4 First Thoughts.